Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is the check valve. Our objective is to introduce check valves and discuss their purpose, construction, method of operation, and application in fluid power systems. Additionally, we'll examine restriction type, pilot to open, and pilot to close check valves. Valves are devices within fluid power systems used to control direction, flow rate, and pressure. The check valve is a valve that selectively blocks fluid flow in one direction and allows fluid flow in another. As we'll learn, this selective passage of fluid can be used for a number of applications. Since this is an early lecture in this sequence, let's discuss terminology commonly applied to most valves. Not all valves have all these features, but this does serve as a pretty good introduction to all things valve for right now. Later lectures will detail the features we don't examine today when it's appropriate to do so. For now, consider this a general orientation after which we'll examine the check valve and apply these terms. First, valves have a valve body, which is a housing for the internal valve components. Additionally, a valve has ports or ways, which are the entry or exit points for fluid, the internal passageways of the valve. Some valves have movable parts like spools or poppets that selectively stop, start, or change direction of fluid flow or modify flow rate or pressure. A poppet, for lack of a better descriptive term, are kind of like plugs. Spools, in contrast, are cylindrical devices with lands and valleys that selectively connect or disconnect the internal passageways of the valve. Poppets and spools may include seals like O-rings to prevent leakage. Some valves include fixed or adjustable springs used to bias, center, or offset the movable components. Finally, some valves include actuation and adjustment methods that allow the valve to be placed in different positions or change the biasing force of a spring. Additionally, valves can be categorized by their mounting method. Valves can be inline, subplate, manifold, cartridge, or stack mounted. An inline valve is quite literally placed in line and directly attached to fluid conductors like pipes and hoses. While inexpensive, any repair or replacement involving an inline valve comes with the ever-present possibility of dorking up the threads, bending, twisting, or breaking the directly attached fluid conductors, or distorting the valve body and causing annoying leaks or catastrophic failures. In contrast, a subplate mounted valve uses a machined subplate directly attached to system plumbing, and the valve is then attached to the subplate with threaded connections. O-rings and or gaskets prevent leaks between the matching valve and subplate ports. Standardized size of subplates and valves allow quick interchangeability. A technician will lock out and tag out the system, remove a couple screws, pop off the old valve, pop on a new one, tighten a couple screws and return the system to service, all without causing more problems. The old subplate mounted valve can be repaired or rebuilt and returned to stock. Manifolds, if you think about it, are kind of like large subplates to which a number of valves can be externally attached. The manifold is a machined metal block into which internal passages are drilled. The manifold is in effect a common circuit free of potential leaks associated with external plumbing. In contrast, cartridge valves screw or slip into passageways drilled into the manifold. Cartridge valves are compact and easily removed and replaced. Finally, stack valves use a mounting style similar to subplate mounted valves, with the exception that a stack valve is intended to mount directly to another valve rather than a subplate, the top valve and the tower being the notable exception. The connected passageways within a tower of stack valves therefore save space, reduce the possibility of leaks, and eliminate the need for external piping. Within a larger system, a combination of these mounting methods can be used. Connections from a hydraulic power unit can be routed to a manifold containing a number of cartridge valves. Then, via flexible hoses or rigid pipes, fluid can be routed from the manifold to subplate mounted valves. A collection of stack valves mounted on a subplate or other inline valves, all controlling the strength, speed, and direction of fluid power actuators. Returning to the intended topic of this lecture, Check valves are extremely simple valves. The cutaway view of a basic check valve shows a movable poppet that fits into a seat machined into the valve body. The movable poppet may or may not be held in place with a light biasing spring. 
When fluid enters in this direction, it overcomes the light biasing force of the spring and pushes the poppet off the seat and fluid flows freely. In contrast, when fluid enters in the opposite direction, it forces the poppet onto the seat and fluid flow stops. Terminology differs from manufacturer to manufacturer. However, the direction of free flow dictates which port is assigned which identifier. The inlet can be called the primary or P port. The outlet can be called the secondary or A port. Check valves often indicate the direction of free flow by scribing an arrow on the side of the valve body. The inscribed arrow is less likely to fall off than a sticker and remains readable when painted over. Don't laugh. This happens more often than it should. The schematic symbol for a check valve shows a ball on a seat because old school check valves really did use a ball rather than a poppet. The ball fell out of favor because over time, the ball would wear a groove in the seat and would function perfectly well until someone took it apart. If the individual responsible for reassembly failed to put the ball perfectly back into the groove, the check valve wouldn't seat properly and allow a degree of leakage in the ordinarily blocked direction. For this reason, most check valves employ a self-guided poppet that easily seals even after reassembly. Regardless, the schematic symbol still uses the ball and seat symbol. Schematically, free flow pushes the ball off the seat. Block flow pushes the ball onto the seat. Note in the free flow direction, fluid must overcome the force of a light biasing spring. This implies a check valve in the free flow direction isn't exactly free and necessitates a little push. This initial push is known as cracking pressure and is the pressure at which the poppet partially unseats. Most check valves have extremely low cracking pressures on the order of 5 psi. At the full open pressure, the poppet fully unseats and allows unrestricted flow. The region between cracking pressure to full open pressure would see increasing flow in the free flow direction as the poppet progressively unseats. Consider, however, a check valve with an extremely heavy bias spring employed as an especially primitive pressure relief valve. For example, Consider a check valve with a heavy bias spring and a cracking pressure of 700 psi and a full open pressure of 800 psi. Up to 700 psi, even the free flow direction of the check valve remains closed and flow rate through it is zero gallons per minute. However, when pressure hits 700 psi, the poppet ever so slightly cracks open and diverts a small portion of the provided flow to the tank. As pressure rises from 700 to 800 psi, the poppet opens more and more and diverts an increasing portion of flow to the tank. Finally, when pressure hits 800 psi, the check valve fully opens and diverts all flow to tank. The system is therefore limited to a maximum pressure of 800 psi. While effective, this primitive means of pressure relief isn't exactly the most elegant of methods principally because of the large differential between cracking and full open pressure inherent to the direct acting nature of this primitive pressure relief valve. We'll examine more sophisticated pilot operated pressure relief valves in later lectures that overcome this difficulty. Sophisticated, by the way, is a euphemism for more complicated. You'll notice, even for a check valve with a light biasing spring, that unrestricted free flow isn't exactly what I would consider unrestricted since the poppet still remains the path of flowing fluid like one of those large waddling beasts or slowly ambling cell phone users that insist on taking up the center of a narrow hallway or sidewalk in the middle of rush hour. Free flowing fluid is forced around the poppet, contributing to turbulent flow, result in pressure drop, heat, noise, and inefficiency. For this reason, consider an alternate arrangement of a basic check valve called a right angle check valve. In this case, fluid flow is still blocked from out to in. However, when flow is routed into out, the poppet is forced out of the path. Free flowing fluid still has to make a hard 90 degree turn, but it sure beats zigzagging around an obstruction directly in the path. Another type of check valve you may run across is something known as a restriction or orifice type check valve. This type of check valve is designed to purposely leak in the block direction. Upon first consideration, this might seem like an extraordinarily stupid idea. However, it does have its uses. First, the leak in the ordinarily blocked direction isn't uncontrolled, but rather a measurable, predictable quantity. 
the restriction type check valve is therefore a means of flow control. Flow rate, if you'll recall, is the principal means the fluid power system uses to influence the speed of a fluid power actuator. A restriction type check valve can therefore allow full speed actuation in one direction by allowing full unrestricted free flow, yet allow reduced speed actuation in the other direction by allowing only a measurable quantity of fluid to pass. A restriction type check valve is basically a regular poppet style check valve with a tiny orifice drilled through the poppet. When fluid enters in the free flow direction, the full poppet is pushed off the seat and fluid flows freely. When fluid enters in the restricted flow direction, the poppet is pushed onto the seat and fluid is forced to travel through the tiny orifice. Given a smaller orifice, only a smaller quantity of fluid can negotiate the narrow path in the same time. Both flow rate and actuator speed are therefore reduced when the restriction type check valve conducts metered flow in the restricted direction. The schematic symbol for a restriction type check valve shows a regular check valve with a fixed restriction drilled through the center of the ball. Free flow pushes the ball off the seat. In contrast, restricted flow pushes the ball onto the seat and is forced to negotiate the tiny passage. It should be noted that even regular check valves exhibit a quantity of leakage in the block position, especially with low, vis especially with low viscosity or thin liquids at high pressures. Let me briefly introduce two more types of check valves before we discuss some basic check valve applications. The previously discussed check valves were direct acting and that fluid directly acts on the poppet face. Consider however a pilot to open check valve that in addition to direct action on the poppet receives a pilot pressure signal X from somewhere else in the system. The cutaway view shows the cap end of a piston receiving the pilot signal X. The piston is linked to the check valve poppet via a connecting rod. Note in this configuration, the primary passage and pilot sections are not connected but only interact via the connecting rod. In the absence of pilot pressure, the pilot open check valve acts just like a regular check valve. In the free flow direction, the poppet is forced off its seat and fluid flows unrestricted through the valve. In the blocked position, the poppet is forced on the seat and fluid flow stops. This behavior radically changes, however, in the presence of a pilot signal. As the name pilot to open implies, when pilot pressure pushes on the piston face, the connecting rod pushes open the poppet and fluid can now pass in both directions unimpeded. When the pilot pressure signal disappears, the bias spring forces the poppet onto the seat and normal check valve behavior resumes. Given liquid is to be considered incompressible, any liquid that leaks past the pilot piston would obstruct its continued movement. For this reason, the vent or drain port on the rod end of the pilot piston ensures any liquid leaking past the pilot piston is drained away. Note the comparatively large area of the pilot piston allows it to hold open the ordinarily blocked direction of the check valve even with comparatively smaller pilot pressure. The schematic symbol for a pilot to open check valve is just like a regular check valve only this time it includes a dashed pilot line on the seat side that pushes open the ball. Again, a pilot to open check valve acts just like a regular check valve in the absence of a pilot signal. One direction is blocked flow, one direction is free flow. In the presence of a pilot signal, the check valve opens and both directions allow free flow. A pilot to close check valve is just the opposite. As the name implies, it acts like a regular check valve in the absence of a pilot signal. One direction is free flow, the other direction is blocked. In the presence of a pilot signal, the check valve closes and both directions are blocked. A pilot to close check valve can be created using our same diagram by simply swapping the pilot and vent ports. In the absence of pilot pressure, the pilot to close check valve acts just like a regular check valve. In the blocked direction, the poppet is forced onto the seat and fluid flow stops. In the free flow direction, the poppet is forced off its seat and fluid flows unrestricted through the valve. This behavior radically changes in the presence of a pilot signal. As the name pilot to close implies, the pilot signal closes the check valve such that both directions are now blocked. When the relocated pilot pressure signal pushes on the piston rod end face, the connecting rod pulls the poppet closed and fluid can no longer pass in either direction. 
When pilot pressure disappears, the poppet is free to move and normal check valve behavior resumes. The schematic symbol for a pilot to close check valve is essentially the opposite of a pilot to open check valve. Again, it's just like a normal check valve, only this time it includes a dashed pilot line on the ball side that pushes the ball to the seat. Again, a pilot to close check valve acts just like a regular check valve in the absence of a pilot signal. One direction is free flow, the other direction is blocked. In the presence of a pilot signal, the check valve closes and both directions are blocked. Our basic orientation to check valves is now complete. Let's quickly discuss a couple basic check valve applications before we bring this lecture to a close. The most obvious application of a check valve is to allow fluid flow in one direction and prohibit it in another. Consider a check valve located on the intake of a pump. In such an application, this check valve might be known as a foot valve. This check valve's orientation allows liquid to be sucked up by the pump. However, when the pump stops pumping, prohibits any liquid in the system from draining out. The foot valve therefore prevents backflow and keeps the pump and system primed and filled with fluid. Alternatively, the check valve could be relocated onto the output of the pump and to the input of the system. This check valve's orientation allows the pump to provide pressurized flow to the system. However, when the pump is disabled, prevents backflow from the system, thereby keeping the system primed and filled with fluid. Consider a quick disconnect with check valves that allow the connection of a portable manometer to a push to connect inspection port. When disconnected, the check valves on each quick disconnect are closed and allow the system to function as intended without leaking. When connected, the quick disconnect pushes both balls off their seats and conducts fluid from the system to the portable measurement apparatus. Consider two check valves on the inlet and outlet ports of a manual pump. The manual pump is essentially a moving piston inside a barrel. As an operator cranks the handle up and down, the inlet and outlet check valves selectively suck up and spit out fluid as the volume of the cylindrical chamber alternately expands and contracts. When an operator pulls the manual pump handle upwards, the expanding cylindrical volume created by the barrel and moving piston sucks in fluid from the reservoir via the inlet check valve permitting free flow. The outlet check valve remains closed during an upward stroke since the pressurized system forces the outlet check valve closed. In contrast, when an operator pushes the manual pump handle downwards, the contracting cylindrical volume created by the barrel and moving piston creates a region of higher pressure and pushes fluid out of the cylinder and into the system via the outlet check valve permitting free flow. The inlet check valve closes during the downward stroke since the pressurized cylinder forces it closed. An operator continues to manually provide pressurized flow to the system with repeated upward and downward strokes of the manual pump handle. An upward stroke sucks in fluid through the open inlet check valve and the outlet check valve remains closed. A downward stroke pushes fluid out of the open outlet check valve and the inlet check valve remains closed. The selective orientation of these two check valves therefore serves to ensure the coordinated one-way flow of pressurized fluid from the reservoir to the pump and from the pump to the system with no possibility of reverse flow. Note as discussed in the Pascal's Law Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, the small volume of high pressure fluid displaced by each stroke of the small manual pump cylinder can be used to actuate a larger cylinder as part of a force multiplication system. Force applied to the comparatively small area of the manual pump cylinder results in a small volume of high pressure fluid displaced into the larger cylinder. The high pressure is applied to the larger piston area results in a larger force. However, due to the small quantity of fluid displaced, the larger piston is only displaced a smaller distance. In this case, distance is traded for force. Repeated applications of the manual pump handle results in repeated, small distance, high force movements of the larger actuator. Such a system could be used to move a massive object over time. Consider four check valves in a special arrangement that ensures the unidirectional flow of fluid through a filter in a system characterized by bidirectional flow. As we'll later learn, filters are fluid conditioning tools ordinarily meant to be run in one direction only. Dirty fluid comes in, clean fluid comes out. If the filter was ran in reverse, it could be a source of contaminants rather than a means of removing them. In this bidirectional system, consider flow traveling from left to right. These check valves permit free flow, and these check valves are blocked. 
Fluid is therefore routed into out top to bottom. When flow reverses its direction, these check valves permit free flow, and these check valves are blocked. Again, fluid flow is routed into out top to bottom as intended. Despite the bidirectional nature of fluid, this special arrangement of four check valves ensures unidirectional flow through the filter. For those knowledgeable of power electronics, you'll immediately recognize this arrangement of check valves as the hydraulic equivalent to a bridge rectifier composed of four diodes. For those not knowledgeable of power electronics, trust me, it is. Although astoundingly different mediums with their own peculiarities, there are some intriguing similarities between hydraulics and electronics, and it's sometimes helpful to compare and contrast the two. Another common application of check valves is to act as bypasses for valves not intended to operate in reverse, or devices that must be temporarily disabled. Bypasses are parallel flow routes around another device that can be selectively enabled or disabled by a check valve. Consider a variable flow control valve with check valve bypass on the cap end of a double acting cylinder. In this application and orientation, the check valve bypass allows the flow control valve to restrict flow traveling to the cap end and thereby limit the extension speed of the rod. Since pressurized flow to the cap end would force the check valve closed, all flow is forced to negotiate the narrow restriction provided by the flow control valve. The closed check valve makes the narrow flow control valve orifice the only available route for fluid. In this case, the cylinder would extend in a controlled and predictable fashion as dictated by the adjustable flow control valve orifice. Conversely, the check valve bypass allows full speed retraction of the cylinder. When pressurized flow is routed to the rod end, it pushes fluid out of the cap end and the check valve bypass allows free flow around the flow control valve. This is what is known as a meter in extension configuration, just one of many flow control methods we'll discuss in later lectures. Importantly, it is not the orientation of the flow control valve that makes metered extension and full speed retraction possible, but rather the orientation of the check valve bypass that does so. When extending, the closed check valve bypass forces fluid to negotiate the narrow flow control valve. When retracting, the open check valve bypass allows free unrestricted fluid flow. Similarly, consider a check valve employed as a clogged filter bypass. In this scenario, the check valve schematic symbol indicates a light biasing spring forcing the ball of the seat. The spring force is such that the check valve remains closed during normal operation and all fluid is routed through the filter for the purposes of removing contaminants. If the filter becomes clogged by contaminants, pressure begins building upstream of it, and at a certain point, it overcomes the biasing force of the spring, and the clogged filter bypass check valve opens. The clogged filter bypass check valve therefore allows the system to circumvent the compromised fluid conditioning apparatus and initiate an orderly shutdown. Note the clogged filter bypass check valve ordinarily includes a visual indicator that such event has occurred, and it is incumbent upon the operator and service technicians that such an event be exceedingly temporary in nature. A system operated without proper level of filtration will eventually be overrun by an accumulation of contaminants and all the valves silted over. We'll discuss fluid conditioning and filtration requirements and methods in later lectures. Come to think of it, I'm gonna hold off demonstrating further applications of check valves until later lectures also, since some of them require an understanding of other components like directional control valves and applications like parking a lifted load and regenerative extension. I want to keep these lectures concise and focused on a single topic. However, expect content in later lectures to make use of this previously discussed material. Long story short, you'll be seeing check valves on a regular basis from now on, and I expect you to know how they work. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the check valve, an essential fluid power component that permits fluid flow in one direction and blocks it in another. First, we introduce some general valve terminology and mounting methods. Next, we examine the construction and method of operation of basic poppet style check valves, right angle check valves, restriction type check valves, pilot to open check valves, and pilot to close check valves. Finally, we discuss some basic applications of check valves, including quick disconnects, backflow prevention, manual pumps, bidirectional filter routing, clogged filter bypasses, and valve bypasses. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. 
Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tap channel for additional resources and updates.